I at least want to start and introduce the Feynman diagrams because we'll need the Feynman diagrams for today's tutorial. So yesterday we <coughs> ended with the definition of time ordering operator for fermions and we saw that for mathematical consistency the time ordering let's put an A or alpha must be of the form psi A of X chi B of Y if X zero is greater than y zero or minus chi b of y psi a of x if y zero is greater than x zero. So this motivates us to define the Feynman propagator. Well, the Feynman propagator is defined as usual. in terms of time ordering. So, <clears throat> so if uh, x naught is greater than y naught, then this is what we have. Otherwise, <clears throat> now the Feynman propagator is, <clears throat> if you look at this, and if you ask, you know, what happens outside the light cone, that is when x and y is space-like, in that case, whether x naught is greater than y naught or y naught is greater than x naught will depend on your point of view. Outside the light cone, that, you know, uh, <coughs> Well, the ordering of points according to the time coordinate is ambiguous, right? So, so here, you know, according to some uh, some observer, this point will be in the future of this point, but there will be an, another observer where, where, you know, they will be simultaneous, right? Because that's how special relativity acts. And in some other observer, this would be in the past of this point. Now, since uh, <coughs> now, since recall that psi bar has in it b dagger, right? So that has that is a creation operator for the particle, whereas psi has in it the um, creation op operator for an antiparticle. So <coughs> outside the light cone whether the Feynman propagator represents the propagation of a particle or whether it represents a propagation of an antiparticle will depend on the, on the observer. Okay. So sometimes you'll see in books, you know, or in some people will say that, you know, um, <clears throat> a particle is an antiparticle traveling backwards in time. So that's a more picturesque way of saying this, of, of, of making the same observation, okay? So <clears throat> the Feynman propagator has um, some related expressions and uh, oops, so it has a, <clears throat> right, so you can now plug in the expressions for psi and psi bar and, uh, you know, you do the usual anti-commutation relationship, you know, and then you can find some expressions for this guy and this guy 
uh, which is non-covariant, manifests, well, they, are, they don't look covariant. They're in three momentum integrals. And I encourage you to do that. But there's also another expression for the Feynman propagator, you know, which involves an integration of over all of all four momentum. And that expression, I think you saw the scalar field version of it. And that expression is given by By definition, a propagator is a solution to the wave equation with a source, right? So the final propagator will be an, a solution to you know, this equation. It will have be of this form. Uh, this factor is of twice pi, uh, 2 pi to the power fourth and stuff like that on this side. There might be an I here, I'm not sure, but, but the point is, in four-dimensional Minkowski space-time, this is a hyperbolic equation. Therefore, it has an infinite number of solutions, so you have to specify the boundary conditions. So, so without telling you how to do this integral, uh, you know, this expression is actually quite meaningless. The way to specify the boundary condition there two different ways. One is to do the plus i epsilon here. Another way to say that, which is what I'll do here, hmm. we are stuck. Uh, I think we, uh, it's probably there's some kind of electrical failure today. So we'll have to work with this, these two boards today. So, so the other way to specify the boundary condition for the Feynman propagator is to specify what is the contour integral that you're going to do for the P0 contour. So when x0 is less than y0, then the contour that you have to choose on the P0 plane is following. So, you know, so this is if you, the I epsilon prescription will give you exactly the same thing. But on the P0 plane, uh, you have, your integrand has two poles. One is at minus E of P. Another one is at plus E of P. And the contour you have to take is uh, you go along the real line and you go below the minus uh, this pole and you go above this pole and then you close the contour in the upper half plane. And you can see this is the correct, uh, <coughs> this is the the way to close this, this is the correct way of closing this because if you look at the zero component of this, <coughs> the P0 integral will only converge if you go to the upper half plane when you, and you take the contour to go to infinity, right? So the contribution from, uh, from the semicircle will uh, vanish rapidly using one of the theorems in complex analysis. And then you can evaluate what the residue of the, integrand, of, the, of the integrand is at this point, because this is the point pole of your integrand that is included inside the contour, and you will find the expression that you would have computed just using, uh, just using uh, this, using the anti-commutation relationship on this. 
And I'm just not, because of time, I'm not going to write down that expression, and it's the details are given in the notes. And similarly, for, uh, for the case where x0 is greater than y0, the contour you choose is, again, you go down this way, you include this, uh, you, 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 you do this a little mouse hole, and then you go around here in the same way, but then you close the contour below. So you go like this, you go. Now, so in ENM, perhaps you may have solved the wave equation with source at some point, and you saw that uh, there were uh, <coughs> um, there was some similar counter integral where, where you had some pole, I think, probably uh, because it was a massless particle at the origin. And uh, when you had to solve the wave equation with source, you had to close the contour either above or below. And uh, you chose the contour in such a way that the solution you got was the retarded propagator, not the advanced propagator. Because the advanced propagator would mean that you have disturbances propagating backwards in time. So <clears throat> in some sense, the Feynman propagator includes, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, it includes both sources. So in, in a sense, it is, uh, you know, uh, it also includes disturbances kind of propagating backwards in time. And that's just another way of saying that, you know, um, you know, outside the light cone, you know, we have, uh, yeah, this is not exactly a very good, uh, okay, I feel kind of a bit uh, uncomfortable saying these statements, but uh, uh, in essence, it's in, it, it captures the observation that we made earlier that uh, the interpretation of a, you know, the interpretation of a, of the Feynman propagator on space-like separation ha is different whether you look at it from a reference point where this is in the feature of this or whether this is in the feature of this, okay? Because in one case, you're doing this integral. In another case, you're doing this integral. And both integrals should be non-zero, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly move on to the topic of today's lecture, and uh, which will be Yukawa theory. Now, before I move on to Yukawa theory, let me just quickly recap. <clears throat> the framework we have for doing computations of S matrices so today's topic is Yukawa theory. At least the microphone is working. <clears throat> so in 1934, Yukawa introduced a theory of interacting nucleons. So interacting nucleons by in which they interact by exchanging a pseudoscalar particle called meson and the masses of the nucleons are about you know he about a thousand uh, MeV, whereas the mesons, um, the mass of the meson is a, a few hundred MeV. And because the nucleons are interacted by exchanging massive particles, that explained why the strong nuclear interaction was so sh had such a short range. So this was a success of Yukawa theory. 
So in today's lecture, we are going to do a version of Yukawa theory, but using not pseudoscalars, but you know, scalar mesons. Okay, before I do that, let me just uh, quickly recap the <coughs> argument that we have for the, the storyline, if you like, for, for, for doing computation in S matrices. And the way we do this is that we start with some, suppose for definiteness, let's take the case where we are scattering two particles to two particles. So what, the way we do this is that in the Heisenberg picture, We create a two-particle sta two state. So we have a two-particle state. Uh, let's just take for the moment, for, for, let's take them to be scalar particles. So this is some two-particle state in the asymptotic past. And then, <laughs> We want to see how, what is the probability of the amplitude for this two particle state to evolve into another two particle state in the asymptotic future with momentum P1 and P2. Right. So remember that in the uh, in the Heisenberg picture, states are time independent, but because they are created by operators which are in different times, so uh, you know, so so that's why the states are labeled by the eigenvalues of the operators that are used to create them. So what we're interested in is what is the overlap between the state in the future and the state in the past. Right. So uh, so let's call this the in state and this the out state. <clears throat> and uh, we can express this in terms of states which are in the, you know, which are in the same, which reside in the, Okay, how should I say this? State which are at the same time that is created by some time, oper so the creation operators which are all evaluated at the same time. But if we do that, then <coughs> we evolve them by the S matrix. So this should be an out and there should be an in and in this, on this right hand side, this state and this state, they are thought to be at the, created by operators at the same time. So then <clears throat> we say that in the S matrix, we are really interested in the part where there's non-trivial interaction in between. So we actually look at the transfer matrix part of it. And then <clears throat> if you do that, This defines for us the matrix element that we are interested in computing using Feynman rules. So these are four momentum times 
i of m and m will depend on these guys. So this is what we are interested in computing using Feynman rules. <coughs> so we assume that in the asymptotic past and in the asymptotic future, so the initial particles in the asymptotic past, they're non-interacting, and the final particles in the asymptotic future are non-interacting. And the way to impose this is to um, convolve the in states and out states with some wave packets which are sufficiently separated on momentum space and therefore by Fourier transform they're also separated in physical space. I mean, so far, things have been very formal. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. Yep, doesn't work. There should have been a manual override. So let's write that down. So particles in uh, in state are uh, are far separated and non-interacting and particles in the out state are far separated and non-interacting and we do this by integrating with uh, some wave packets. Okay. And then we come to uh, a more tricky assumption. And uh, I added a line in my notes in this in this point, uh, and this is not the notes that I not in the notes that I emailed you, but I actually replaced the notes uh, on the wiki. So we assume that the in the asymptotic past and the future, the in states and out states are created by the creation and the annihilation operators acting on the free vacuum in the interaction picture. So we assume that in the interaction picture that our asymptotic states, the in states and out states, are actually created by uh, by the creation operator and the annihilation operator from the interaction picture acting on the free vacuum. And uh, this to justify this is not uh, very obvious. And uh, it's done in two steps. So I'm borrowing this from Peskin. Peskin writes in this way that the transfer matrix So there's an infinity plus minus i epsilon. This minus i epsilon is introduced to for convergence reasons. Um, and uh, this is given by zero, meaning the free theory. And the time ordered exponential this is the t that you're taking to infinity. 
This is the interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture. So two i is here. And this is the initial state. And this is done in two steps. One is to invoke the LSZ formula and to, and this is shown in chapter seven of Peskin. And the idea of the LSZ formula is that if you take the, 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 the four point function in this case, Now, in general, this is a very abstract quantity, and uh, it'll have all kinds of observables included in it, not necessarily only observables that you can see in scattering experiments. And in scattering experiments, it's, it's a very limited set of observables. But there are other observables, right? You could, if, you know, suppose you are in quark gluon plasma, you can measure the viscosity of your quark gluon plasma, or you, uh, you have a field theory describing some condensed matter system, you can talk about the conductivity and stuff like that. There's all kinds of observables that your quantum field theory should be able to describe, which have nothing to do with scattering experiments. Okay? So in principle, you know, all these things are, really, are encoded in various correlation functions, so these, they're very abstract objects. Here, the omegas are the interacting vacuum. So this, this is, you know, uh, I've written this in the Heisenberg picture. And then what you do is that if you take the Fourier transform of this guy and uh, make the, in the Fourier transform, make the momentum go on shell. So you put the momentum uh, to be the momentum of the incoming and the outgoing physical particles then this thing has a form which I'm just going to pictorially write as the four exact propagators and some interaction. Okay? And then you can show that the S matrix element that you're interested in is the part where once you have amputated the external propagator, whatever is left, that part is your, <coughs> is your S matrix. So that's step number one. Step number two is to then expand this object using Dyson's formula as a perturbation theory series in the interaction picture. So this thing has an expression in terms of Dyson's formula Sorry. Right. Uh, meaning, uh, hang on, just let me. So. so what I mean is that the, uh, uh, we, we don't have board space, but so by this blob, what I mean is that suppose you were in uh, scalar theory, you know, this would be your, uh, your Feynman propagator would have this, and then, uh, a different kind of blob, this, uh, and then, uh, sorry, I think this is included in here, right? Yeah. And, uh, what is this? And then you can decompose this guy as the free pop propagator plus, suppose we are in, uh, say, cubic uh, five to the four theory, right? You'll have all kinds of um, so. okay. So this means that yeah. So this is going to be uh, 
<coughs> the sum of all these diagrams, okay? And then amputating them really means like replacing them by the posterior. Right. The, yeah, so no, you amputating them, you just like knock them off. You just, you know, they, they will factor in this way, and you just, you know, you, you just don't take them. Okay, so uh, this is roughly the story that, uh, at least in my mind, sits uh, when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, doing S matrix calculation. But what is important is that I'm going to <coughs> use this fact, and I'm going to use this expression to compute uh, the scattering amplitudes. Uh, so those of you who came a bit late, uh, the blackboards are not working, so, like they're not being magical today. So we are actually uh, reduced to uh, erasing everything by hand. So I guess I could go on that side, but I'm not sure if uh, the cameras can follow us. Uh, hello out there. Can you follow us if we go to that side and those side? Oh, thank you, Mark. Okay, so that frees us up a little bit more. These are exceptional circumstances. Okay, sorry, your uh, neck will have to do some work. <laughs> so what's the theory we are working with today is, uh, oh, these are nicer blackboards. So this is the uh, Yukawa theory of nuclear physics. So we have a, Lagrangian for fermions, and we have a Lagrangian for the scalar particle, which we are calling the the uh, the meson, and the interaction term called Yukawa interaction. And the generalization of this Yukawa interaction is what you will see in the standard model: the the interaction terms between the matter sectors and the Higgs. It's actually a generalization of this guy. So. So it's good uh, that you're seeing it here. So, so the fermion is, uh, so let's just take one nucleon. So uh, you can generalize this to multiple nucleon. <coughs> so this is just given by the Dirac Lagrangian where the M is the mass of the nucleon. And L of phi is a real scalar field. It can also be generalized to a complex scalar field. So big M is the mass of the, uh, of the scalar particle. And L yuck is, right. So can someone tell me what is the dimension of psi? Remember? What was the dimension of psi? Anyone? D half minus one. Three half. D half. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. So in four dimension, what is that? One. No. Uh, three over. It should be three, three halves. Oh, yeah. Okay? And you can see it by, by looking here, right? I mean, uh, this should have dimension of, uh, dimension of four, right? So if it's this three half, this is three half, this is three, and this is, has dimension one, so this is four. So, so this has dimension three halves, this has dimension three halves, this is dimension one. So lambda is dimensionless. Right? Sorry. <coughs> now, <coughs> this Lagrangian has a phase symmetry. So if you replace this by a global phase, then the Lagrangian remains invariant. So there's a conserved charge, and the conserved charge is the nucleon number. Okay, so <clears throat> we can call it a, the conserved charge is the nucleon number. In the standard model, you will have some of these conserved charges. 
but uh, there are some global symmetries of the standard model, but it turns out you actually don't have to work those into your standard model. Uh, there is some symmetry that we'll see later on in this course called gate symmetry. Once you fix the gate symmetries, the global symmetries of the standard model, such as the lepton number, uh, baryon number, they become, uh, they're actually accidental. So the fact that you know, we have lepton number conservation and, and baryon number conservation in nature, you know, from the point of view of standard model, they actually arise, they are known as accidental symmetries. You know, this is something you'll see in your standard model course. Okay? So, so we are interested in calculating this. So now this is the Hamiltonian density interaction, Hamiltonian density in the interaction picture. So <laughs> to expand this, we will now need Wick's theorem. So let my, so let us state Wick's theorem. And the Wick's theorem for two particles is very easy to show, or two fields. Uh, so <clears throat> you can easily show that this is, and this is a good uh, interview question, show Wick's theorem. Some of you will be asked this question. So you take the normal ordering and the contraction and the contraction is defined by implicit by, implicitly by this uh, uh, you know by this uh, expression as whatever is left behind after you've written uh, you, you have normal ordered your operators so in this case, the contraction turns out to be Can someone tell me what uh, the plus and minus mean? The creation part. Which one is creation? Plus or minus? Which one has creation operator? Uh, minus. minus, good. Okay, and you can verify that this is The Feynman propagator. <clears throat> now we can do similar calculations, and uh, suppose you ex instead of psi and psi bar, you have two psi's. And if you have two psi's, then you know once you normal order it, you will find you will end up with uh, whatever you end up with. You have you define that to be the contraction. And due to the fact that a psi will anti-commute with psi, this will turn out to be zero. Similarly, psi bar and psi bar, the contractions of those guys will be zero. And also, if I make field phi, I phi. Right, I mean, uh, yeah. phi and psi will, uh, will commute. So, yeah. Yeah, those are, if you, you can define formally, those contractions to be zero as well. So, uh, okay. uh, so in general, if you have a string of operators in the time ordering, suppose we have psi 1, psi 2 bar, psi 3, dot, 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 then Wick's theorem plus you know, all possible constructions uh, 
times whatever is left is in <coughs> normal ordering. Now, if you have more than two uh, normal ordering, uh, uh, fermionic, op fermionic operators in the normal ordering, then <coughs> the way to, uh, okay, so, okay, so let's look at this thing, sorry. Anti-commutator. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you know, the, in this kind of contraction, what we are trying to do is that we we are taking this master, you know, master, uh, in expression, and 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 doing say the first only one contractions, and then we we uh, pull them out, and then we do two contractions, and we pull them out. So there will be one contraction term, two contraction term, three contraction term, so on and so forth. And But since these are fermionic operators, you have to be careful because suppose you do the contraction between, say, psi 1, uh, there is psi 1, say, psi 2, and psi 3 bar. And uh, you're considering this contraction. So before you can pull this out, what you need to do is to make sure they're next to each other, and in this case, to make sure that they're next to each other means that you have there. There is an odd, only one permutation of operators. So, so you will pick up a minus sign because there's an odd number of uh, of permutation. So you have psi one, psi three bar, and then psi two dot dot. Now, once you have, <coughs> you know, they are adjacent to each other. This object is no longer an operator. This object is a scalar quantity, right? This object is just, you know, a, an anti-commutator. An anti-commutator of two operator is actually a scalar object. So then you can just bring this out. Psi 1 and Psi 3 bar. And, okay, so this is how you use, uh, how you compute uh, this part. All right, uh, so with these uh, tools, let us uh, do a calculation. We shall do this calculation, sorry, two nucleon scattering. And just for completeness, let me write out the expression for a psi, which you already know. If you don't, then you should go and die. I'm sure I'll make a mistake right as I say those words. <laughs> so I have to be careful now. I will die by falling off these stairs, that is. Okay. This is very challenging, guys. Oh yeah, we don't have that, uh, okay. Yes, all right. So uh, psi bar is uh, given by similar things, but here you have got a u bar, you have a b dagger, you have e to the power i p dot x, and you have v bar, you have c, you have e to the minus i p dot x and uh, phi, which is the scalar particle, and we are taking it to be real. Our our favorite uh, invariant measure. By the way, to show that this is Lorentz invariant is a good interview question. <laughs> I'm giving you clues so those who are not coming to class, they will suffer in the interview, as they should. Are you not going to give interview? Yeah, of course I'm going to, but you know, it's not possible to give you all the questions, right? So, right, okay. So these are the, uh, 
the expansion of the field operators, and then let's write the in state. So the in state is two particles with the spin state labeled by S and R and momentum P and K acting on the free vacuum. And the out state, sometimes I've written it as the final state, is similarly B dagger of all I put are just primes on stuff. Right. So this is the ket, the bra is involves All right, and pictorially, what is happening is that we have two particles with spin label S, momentum K, and what spin it is in will depend on the spinner you attached. And, uh, Sorry, yeah? In the in state and the out state, you have a relation operator? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Somebody's awake. <clears throat> so the particles coming in, stuff happening, particles going out. There are other particles going out as well, but these are the particles that we are keeping track of, right? So there's something with momentum P prime, spin label R prime. And uh, momentum uh, K prime, spin label S prime. Okay. All right. So we want to compute this. So our interaction Hamiltonian <coughs> has uh, is of this form. So it's uh, yeah. Well, because it's Hamiltonian, I wrote d cubed. is of this form. So it's a local Hamiltonian. And phi has a creation, an annihilation part and a creation part. Now note that neither our in state nor our out state has any phi particles, right? The, the final state and the initial states don't have phi particles. That means phi plus acting on the in state and phi minus acting on the out will give us zero. Okay? So when we do a Dyson expansion, the order of lambda, the, the, the order lambda term will give us zero. So to get non-trivial term, you know, contribution to our S matrix, we have to go to lambda squared. And why is that? Because in the lambda squared, there will be two factors of, of this guy under the time ordering. And when we use the Wick's theorem, when we use Wick's theorem, the phi from one guy and the phi from the other guy will contract, and therefore they will become just a Feynman propagator, and they will not contribute. They will not annihilate the in or the out vacuum, okay? <clears throat> no, in or out state. So Wick's theorem will give, give us uh, this thing, and that will save the day. Okay, so, so what is the S matrix element at this order? It is given by, we have two factors of I lambda squared, because the Dyson series is an exponential, so we have a one over factorial of two. Uh, so yeah, let us skip the break, because we just want to finish this calculation today. Sorry, but <clears throat> I'll try to finish early if I can. 
So the out state, let's call that F. Inside there's a time uh, ordering operator. There are two integrals coming from uh, the second order in the Dyson series. There's one interaction term, and they're at space-time point x1, which I will label in this way, and there's a bar here. And then there's a phi psi psi bar x2, which I will label like this, and then there is an in state. <clears throat> and uh, then what we can do is that we can say, okay, uh, we can, oh, this is a, uh, okay, let me not do that. That's, apparently that's really bad practice. So we can uh, apply Wick's theorem, so now we have normal ordering here. And then we have this. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> yeah. Uh, root uh, pi and pi bar uh, the other way around in comparison to the new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. This doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. It's a matrix. Where else have I? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and I also wrote the right way in my notes, but somehow. Anyway, thank you. So <clears throat> our in state and out state have only particles. And therefore, but if you look at psi, psi has creation operator and annihilation operator for. <laughs> Antiparticles as well. You know, those guys, they will go and they will annihilate both the in state and the out state, right? So <clears throat> the part of this matrix element that we're interested in are the part where the, the part of those operators which only have the Bs in it and the B daggers in it. We are not interested in the Cs and C daggers because our in-state and out-states do not have C type of particles. So therefore, either C, C, C will destroy either this guy, and C dagger will destroy this guy, right? Why don't we have the contractions into the size? The size? Yeah, the size. We have not applied. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, we <coughs> do have contractions between psi. But what I've done is that implicitly in using that formula, I, those contractions you can show only contribute to the vacuum bubble diagrams. And by dividing with the, uh, the, with the time order exponential in, in, you know, in that expression, <coughs> implicitly what I'm doing is that I'm writing this, doing this expansion so that the, you know that the that the denominator cancels all the vacuum bubbles, and therefore, you know, those vacuum bubbles will be eliminated. And uh, that's why I'm actually uh, not, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the reason why I'm not including those things. But, but, so, but where are the propagators for the, for the size field? Like, I, I, I would think there, that... so the, yeah, the, <clears throat> There are no propagators for the psi fields. The only way that you could have propagators, uh, uh, okay, so, you know, <clears throat> so what, you know, from here, coming from here to here, you would say, okay, I could have some, you know, we could have psi one and psi two, mm. right? And then I could also have, say, uh, 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 psi two, psi two, Right, uh, sorry, uh, psi one. Right, so <clears throat> so what would that look like? You have some point one, and you have some point two, and then you have something going like this, something going going like this. Right, and uh, 
Sorry? No. Because Phi uh, 1 and Phi 2 will not have a. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'll have something like this, right? Yeah. And. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, right? And. Uh, sorry? Like, why can't you just have one of those? Why can't I have just one of those? I mean, e e OK, right. Uh, isn't it because of what you said before about No, hang on. Uh, just. Mm. Ah, I see, right. So, sorry, sorry. So, <clears throat> so if we contract, you know, if you contract the, you know, the operators which are, <clears throat> say, so, okay. In weak, in the, you know, when we apply Wick's theorem, there will be terms where you are actually contracting those things. But if you look at those terms, uh, those terms will actually be terms in which the in state just propagates automatically to the out states, right? And by definition, we are saying that those are not this kind of processes. So those are not scattering processes, right? So that's why we are not considering those things. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, sorry. I, yeah. But I was confusing. Yeah. I was still thinking in terms of the LS. LS. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean. I mean. So yeah. So so that's the that's that's really the re reason. So there are those things in principle, but uh, you know there will be uh, they won't be considering they won't be co uh, contributing to your scattering processes. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, okay. So. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so we are only interested in the B part, so we can write our uh, transfer matrix as And here we have got uh, <coughs> so here we have got like four four operators. Let me just expand out two of the operators. Suppose we have normal ordered them. So uh, once we have normal ordered them, and uh, the one which stand on the far right, we are just expanding those out. The other two, I'll show that they follow analogously. So I'm, so there are a couple of steps here which are, I'm not giving you, that you can do, or you can see easily. K1, K2, and then You have some spin sum TT prime, and I'm not expanding these creation operators, and these creation operators are contracted with a spinner, which I am expanding. So psi 2 is contracted with U T prime of K2. And uh, because I'm expanding these guys, there would be an exponential coming from there, k1, x1, minus i, k2, x2. And now the, cre the annihilation operator, which came from the expanding these guys, bt of k, bt prime of, uh, sorry, this is k1 and this is k2. And then what we also do is that we expand the in state over there. So the final state we haven't expanded. So 
this times now the in state has bs dagger of k br dagger of p and then phi 1 and phi 2 okay. and then what you do is that you you use so so this is now normal order so we we had normal ordering for for these four operators and they are now normal ordered and these operators come from the in state but now what we can do is that we can take this string of four operators and use the anti-commutation relationships and then, uh, you know, uh, and push all the annihilation operator on the right. And at the end, we, are, we will end up with an expression which has no operator but a bunch of delta functions. Okay, and once you, <coughs> uh, so what is that expression? Uh, okay, once you have that expression, and you can show that that expression will have two delta functions, you can do the k1 and the k2 integrals in that expression. And uh, once you do the k1 and k2 integrals, you know, uh, you will find that you end up with this expression for, for the transfer, element of the transfer matrix. And now, here I'm expanding F. F will have this form. Times <clears throat> there's a minus sign coming from all the anti commuting you're doing, and uh, and there's an exponential. And uh, because you did the delta functions, the delta functions will set the k1 and k2 to the momentum of the initial and the final particle. Sorry, the two initial particles. So it'll be k dot x1 minus ip dot x2. And uh, then there will be uh, this guy. And then... <coughs> Uh, right. Okay, let me just uh, not write this yet. Not close the bracket yet. And then there will be another term, which will be minus u of, oh, sorry, you can't really see it, right? Uh, okay. okay, let me write it over there. So this is like a, a tedious calculation that the details are given in the notes. I'm doing it nonetheless because last year I didn't do it, and some student complained that I didn't do it. So maybe this year I'll get a complaint that why do it what, since it's already in the notes. But the point is that if I don't go through it, you know, you actually don't think about it. And you know, just ask the questions. You know, there are always interesting questions coming out, so it's actually worth doing, I think. So okay, let me write the, that expression again over here. Where did the minus come from, by the way? Uh, it just comes from uh, doing all those. Uh, so here, if you, if you look at it, um, the two terms that you get actually have a, have a relative minus sign. And it's just the way I've ordered it is that there's an overall minus sign. It's, it's nothing important. And that minus sign doesn't really mean anything. So, because you're going to square it at some point. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh,
So I think I'm going to avoid that blackboard. It's very awkward. Oh, it's not over yet. Okay, so this is what you get. So, <clears throat> like in the first uh, few steps, now we can expand these guys out. And when you expand these guys out, you get factors of Bs, annihilation operator. <coughs> and then what you do is that you, uh, sorry, uh, B daggers. And then what you do is that you, you, you uh, commute them and anti-commute them in such a way that the final result is normal ordered. So the creation operator send the left to the right over here and over here. And uh, then you, uh, you know, those guys annihilate this vacuum and you end up with two delta functions again. And then you do the integral again. And uh, <clears throat> right. So, and then what you can show is that by relabeling the two terms, which the stuff that comes from this term and the stuff that comes from this term, that you can show that, you know, so each of these guys will give you two terms. But the two terms which come from here as well as here, you can show that they're actually the same term. <clears throat> and so at the end, after you've done <clears throat> all the momentum integrals, you're left with some, a lot of exponentials. In it, you get two more exponentials from expanding these guys and these guys. <clears throat> And then what you can do is that you can do uh, the x1 integral and the x2 integral. <clears throat> and uh, as a result, you will end up in an overall four momentum delta function. OK? So when you've done all the integrals, you will get a 2 pi 4. And the details are given in the notes. And an overall momentum integral for momentum integral, sorry, uh, delta function, <clears throat> and two terms, each coming from this guy and this guy. Sorry, two like this guy and this guy will give you the same two terms. And that'll probably uh, cancel out, that'll probably can that can cancel out this factorial of two. Then you have minus i lambda two lambda i lambda squared. That'll remain unchanged. And uh, over here, you will see that from here you will get a u bar, which will contract with this u. So you get a u bar r prime of p prime, and uh, that will contract with u of s of k. And this is, one, this is a number. <clears throat> and this will multiply uh, this guy. So from here, you will get u s prime bar of k prime. And that will contract with this thing, u of r of p. Okay.
And then you also have the propagator coming from this thing. And the momentum difference uh, dependence of the propagator will have this form. And then you'll get a minus of a similar term, which is uh, u bar s prime <coughs> k prime. So this thing. Awesome. And this is u of s. Sorry. This is a, a, a different contraction. Then you have a u bar of r prime of p prime contracted with u of r of p. And uh, the propagator now has a different momentum dependence, and I'm including the i epsilon, and uh, this is what you get. So our matrix element M is this part. And now what we're going to do is that we're going to pictorially represent this integral. The, fi the final result of this, of this result, of the matrix element. Sorry. So uh, Feynman and Schwinger, they both uh, came up with roughly the same theory for QED. Schwinger's approach uh, you know, had involved a lot of computations. Feynman's approach involved uh, drawing dark pictures, intuitive pictures, and writing down the amplitudes for them. So uh, Schwinger said that Feynman brought Quantum field theory to the masses. Okay, so in the first <coughs> first term, we can say that okay, we can interpret uh, say this guy as a as a nucleon with spin state r and momentum p coming in and a nucleon with a spin state S prime and a momentum, uh, uh, sorry, spin S prime and momentum uh, state K prime going out. So we can, <coughs> that factor, we can uh, represent it by an arrow. And for us, time will go in this way. So the arrow on the line means that it's a charged particle. Okay, so, but a separate arrow means that is the direction of the flow of momentum. And then this other factor has the interpretation of a nucleon coming in with momentum k and going out with momentum p prime and spin states S and R prime in and out. Whether you draw that arrow first or the or this arrow first, so this line first or that line first doesn't matter. So <coughs> we have momentum K S, and this is the direction of the momentum. And then what we have here is, is the propagator. And the propagator, you can think of it as this particle 
shooting out a meson which has momentum p minus k k prime and uh, this is not a particle which is on shell so we don't write it as a three momentum <coughs> and because it's a real scalar particle it does not carry any charge and therefore we don't decorate this line with an arrow whereas these lines we decorated them with an arrow okay and you can show that uh, you can see uh, that this particle came in with momentum p and this particle took away momentum k prime so if this particle takes momentum p minus k then the momentum is conserved at this point and then up to the overall momentum, if you impose the overall momentum conservation, then all vertices have momentum conserved. So from this, let us write down our first Feynman rule, is that for <coughs> incoming fermion, of momentum p and spin polarization label r we associate A spinner factor U R of P. And uh, we draw this thing where the momentum is coming in P R, and there's an arrow here. So this will interact with other stuff, which is you know, which we will come to. From the same diagram, we, we also conclude that for outgoing fermion of momentum, say P and spin polarization label R, we associate a u bar r of p. Okay, so the picture is uh, stuff happened here. The particles is going out. This is the arrow of arrow of uh, this arrow denotes the flow of charge, and uh, this is the momentum p. Spin r. Okay. So for outgoing. For incoming particle fermions, you write the spinner. For the outgoing, you write the conjugate spinner. Okay, and uh, So number three is that we label <coughs> fermion lines, each fermion line with an arrow so that flows in the same direction as time, at least for the external states. Uh, okay, for the external states. But when you write the 
the spin fa the spinner factors, but as you uh, okay okay uh, so you write down. the spinner factors from left to right as you follow the fermion arrow in the opposite direction in the, uh, as you follow the fermion arrow in the direction, let's say opposite direction. Okay, well, what, do I, what do I mean by all this? What I mean is that so you've drawn a fermion coming in and a fermion going out, but you want to write down what the amplitude of this is. What you do is that <coughs> you take this fermion line and see which direction the arrow is going, and then you follow it in the opposite direction. And as you follow it in the opposite direction, you see that a fermion has been, is going out. So when you see that, you first write down the Feynman rule for an outgoing fermion. So you write down U bar. So as you go in this direction, you first write down U bar because you write from left, you write from left to right. And then when you come here, you see a fermion was going in. It's an incoming fermion. So you write a factor of U. Right? So this, you know, uh, this way of following the arrow opposite in the direction while you go right from left to right uh, makes you know makes sure that everything is uh, whatever you write down is a mathematically consistent thing that you don't have a, a, an outer product of a matrix for example right well, and if we had antiparticles we're we're coming to antiparticles ah, okay. yeah but the uh, arrows in the picture show the flow of the negative charge. Uh, well, what do you call negative and positive is really entirely up to you. It depends on you. In fact, you know, uh, it, it depends on your point of view. In this case, it's actually a nuclear number. A net nuclear number, yeah. But, uh, Which means that you can take the negative charge to be, uh, what in what I said, to be charge of the particle. Right, right. So, yeah, you know, uh, the... You can replace lambda by minus lambda, and nothing changes in your theory. Okay. So now um, we are not going to do it, obviously, but you can do an analogous calculation where you scatter is an antinucleon with another antinucleon, and uh, I have uh, five more minutes. I think today is the day I'm going to overrun. And uh, so incoming antifermion you used to say the V bar and uh, so time is again going in this direction but now the arrow is like this. So this is the incoming antiparticle. So incoming antifermion and outgoing antifermion. Uh, outgoing antifermion. So time is going this way. Okay, 
and then for each <coughs> vertex, so for each of these guys, doesn't matter what in what direction uh, you know time is uh, going. you associate a factor of minus i lambda. By the way, in a theory which conserves charge, you cannot have arrows such as this. The arrows, if an arrow flows into a vertex, it must go out. <coughs> okay. And then similarly, for the, you know, for the fermion, we also have an exactly the same rule for the antifermion, where you still go against the arrow as you write down the spinner factor associated with the antifermions from left to right. Okay, so uh, that's number seven in my notes. Uh, number eight. So I'm uh, rushing through, and I really encourage you to uh, read over these rules uh, as preparation for today's tutorial. So then what we can do, we can just, we can uh, compute another process which would be the scattering of a fermion and a meson. And the, and the diagram that we would write for this would have a meson and a fermion in the out, in state and the out state. <clears throat> and for the internal <coughs> line, which we denote by just a line, uh, so this is a fermion uh, internal line or fermion propagator, and it has a full momentum P propagating it. And for this, we associate, you can show a factor such as this. And note that this thing is a four by four matrix, okay? And uh, so here, the lexicographic ordering is very important. So if you have a diagram like this, what you do is that you find a fermion line, so you follow against the fermion line, so this is an outgoing fermion. So as we saw there, an outgoing fermion will have a U bar. So this is a row matrix. Uh, uh, yes, it's a row matrix. And then we go, we follow here. So you have to follow through the whole fermion line as you go Along the propagate along the internal line, you write down the propagator, which is a four by four matrix. And then you come here where it's an incoming fermion, so you get a U. So row four by row vector, four by four matrix, column vector, so the whole thing is a number. Okay? And uh, my last Feynman rule of the day is that if you have more than one diagram, <coughs> uh, okay, <sighs> which uh, so we let's come back quickly to our original example. We only drew the diagram for this guy. We did not draw the diagram for this guy. So let's do the diagram for this guy. We had a particle coming in with uh, momentum P and spin label R. And it's going out with momentum P prime, spin label R prime. Another particle coming in, 
with momentum k and spin label s going out with uh, k prime and spin label s prime and the exchanging a meson which has momentum p minus p prime okay <clears throat> now if you have for some process two diagrams like this and if you see that they're on the the <clears throat> The final particle states of these two diagrams, you can get one from the other by a relabeling of the final states. If it's an if it's an odd number of permutation of the final states, then <coughs> the amplitude that you write down for for these two guys will have a relative minus sign. Okay? And in this case, we do have because in this case, you know, you see that the initial states are the same, but the final states are permuted, right? But there's only one permutation. In principle, in general, finding the minus signs within relative, within two different, two, uh, you know, two or more uh, Feynman diagrams is a, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very subtle, uh, it's actually a non-trivial process. And uh, the whole, uh, the first part of today's tutorial will actually be devoted to that. How do we f think about, correctly think about finding the minus signs? So let me give you, end this uh, class giving you another uh, example where there is a minus sign. And, uh, And I will just briefly argue how that comes about. So let's, uh, let's take the scattering of a particle and an antiparticle. So we have a scattering of a an particle and an antiparticle. So uh, let's think of the, this as a detector observing a, an anti, a particle of P prime and an antiparticle of K prime and R our prime uh, polarization. So there's P and S, K and R. But you will see that the rules of the game also allow you to have this diagram. And this, what you can show, or you can, if you think about it for a minute, you see that the space-time point in which the particle came in, the outgoing particle was created at the same space-time point. So in, in a sense, you know, uh, in the interaction Hamiltonian, you had a psi bar psi and phi at some space-time point, and this thing happened at the in this same factor. Whereas, you know, the antiparticle coming in and the antiparticle going out, that business happened in the second factor. Whereas here, you know, the point in which the particle came in and the point in which the particle went out, there are different space-time points. So there, you know, the absorption operator for the particle coming in would be here where the, the creation operator for the particle going out would be here. And similarly for the antiparticles. And so the idea is that when you have identified the creation and the annihilation operators that you need for each of these two terms, and you write them out in the same order in both cases. If in comparison, you know, uh, one of the term involves an odd number of permutation, then you have an overall minus sign, okay? And this is, uh, we'll uh, explore this in more detail in today's tutorial. Okay, thank you.